Hello and welcome to this BCS, the Chartered Institute for IT interview. Today I'm with Grady Booch, the Chief Scientist for Software Engineering at IBM Research. Grady, welcome. Thank you. Now, later on this evening you're giving this year's Lovelace lecture. Correct. Could I just ask you to go over what it, will, what it is you will be talking about? Well, in my professional journey I've been moving from software architecture and software engineering to kind of opening the curtain to compute, of computing to the general public. Mm -hmm. So the lecture you're going to hear tonight is where that journey has taken me. Uh, we have been working, when I say we, my wife and I have been developing the last five years a uh, major documentary on computing and the human experience. Okay. And one of the themes we're attending to is really sort of the end consequences of, of computing. Uh, where does it lead us relative to uh, computing and humanity? And indeed, asking the question, is the mind computable? Okay. If we get to that point, it has enormous consequences for us, personally and societally. Okay, that sounds fascinating. Now, you gave the Turing Lecture in 2007. Correct. And uh, you spoke to BCS then. Yes. Now, obviously, software has moved on quite significantly in those six years. How, what do you think is the, some of the biggest changes you've seen over the sale of that? Well, I'm going to, uh, to question your premise about okay. has software really moved on that far? Okay. The way I would characterize it is software has woven its ways into the interstitial spaces of the world mm -hmm. far more than it has in the last six years. Of this, I would agree. I would also observe that we see more in the last six years uh, the Internet of Things and the movement of software to the edges of society. Now that we have the explosion of mobile devices, your tablet, my phone, all these things that put software edges out to the individual human, we're seeing the increasing movement of software out in society. That's the biggest change perhaps in the last six years. What has not changed, I think, is that the art of creating software is still very difficult. It's also the case that software always was, and even more so now, uh, moves its way into virtually every part of society. I think the difference perhaps in those six years, it's much more intimate computing than it used to be. There's a phrase one of my colleagues used, has used that we're now moving in an era from used to be corporate computing to personal computing. We're in an age of ambient computing where very much software and all that surrounds us is very much in the atmosphere. So has the uh, take-up of apps and such, has that surprised you in any way? Has it surprised me? Very little surprises me in this mm -hmm. business. Uh, some people often ask me, is this a revolution? Uh, I've always viewed it to be an evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, as an engineering process, uh, we build systems that respond to the societal and technical and economic forces around us. And what's happened, I think, is that we now have these forces that have led us to the particular place where software and, and hardware are much, very much in the atmosphere. Okay. So you're the chief scientist mm -hmm. for uh, at, at IBM, for IBM Research. What sort of things do you work on as, as a sort of a day-to-day -day basis? Well, there's no day that's typical, mm -hmm. but there are three things that I tend to spend my time on. Uh, first, on the documentary. Uh, IBM gives me tremendous degrees of freedom to be able to pursue that. And it makes sense for both IBM and society at large because we're really trying to open the curtain of computing upon society and begin to have a dialogue. So as an insider, trying to open up what we know about the beauty and fragility of software-intensive systems to the general public. So that's one of the things I work on. I also continue to work in the area of software architecture and software engineering, where I will work with customers in particular on trying to engineer very, very large software-intensive systems. In these days, it's more so how does one transform existing systems to embrace new innovative things. The moment you write a line of code, it becomes legacy. So this becomes a problem not just of the large existing banks, but even the Facebooks and Googles of the world. Even those organizations begin to have legacy issues. The third space where I'm spending my time is in the area of cognitive computing. I had the delightful opportunity to work with the Watson team a few years ago as they had just finished their competition. I was asked to come in and codify their architecture, so taking what I know from that space and looking at their million plus lines of code, capturing in a way so that as it was passed over to the commercialization teams, they had a blueprint in which to move on. My work has further continued in the cognitive space because we have developed a, a non-von Neumann machine uh, that is massively parallel. We're talking a number of devices that equal the number of neurons in the human brain. Mm -hmm. And so the question there is, how does one architect a mind? And that is the question I am pursuing. 
Right. No small problems. No, me. no, that's rather a big problem. <laughs> so, I mean, what, I mean, one of the, the, the biggest things in uh, in computing is the Turing test, and whether you know computers and uh, robots and AI can ever be that convincing. Yes. You've spoken on it in the past. Has, has your has your feelings changed in any way? Do you think it'll ever be possible? I believe very much so. I'm a reductionist mm -hmm. in the sense that I believe there's no magic that happens up here. And yet we still don't quite understand the mechanisms that make that work. Now this is indeed a theme of my lecture tonight. Mm -hmm. I do respect that there are alternate views. My wife in particular takes the contrary in view mm -hmm. uh, in that there is something special. Uh, Sir Roger Penrose takes a similar view that he believes there's something happening down at the quantum level. Mm -hmm. uh, but everything in my experience tells me there is no magic and the brain, the mind is indeed computable. Okay. We're, I, I'm not of the ilk of, uh, of Ray Kurzweil, however, that believes we're just around the corner. Mm -hmm. I think we're still a generation or two away from really understanding that. So it's not going to happen in our lifetime? Uh, unless uh, I can prove to you that I'm actually a machine and I'm just talking to you. So. Well, you're very convincing. If I guess I am. I passed the Turing test. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if I would be the benchmark or whatever. There we go. <laughs> now, um, obviously, software is, as you've said, going to all aspects of, of our everyday lives yes. from the software. I mean, you've talked in the past about um, software that's helped in your with your medical history. Correct. And obviously, the software that's uh, operating the planes and the and then what have you. Do you think, you know, with all this soft spread of software, that um, <coughs> there should be a greater focus on security in, in, in within software, or is there a, a, enough of a focus? There's a phrase I sometimes use that if if builders built buildings the way that software engineers wrote software, the first woodpecker to come along would destroy civilization. Actually, I have that backwards. Let's try that again. If builders built buildings, that's right. I did say it right. Anyway, what I'm trying to say <laughs> is that software is exquisitely fragile. Mm -hmm. And the difference, I think, in the past few years is that we have moved software-intensive systems to the place where individual lives depend upon them. And so the risks are far higher. So you ask, do we need to turn up the dial with regards to our, our worry about security? Well, obviously, because as the risk increases, we also need to attend to increasing security. And when we speak security, let's use that in a very broad sense. It's not just we don't want software to break. If I am flying a plane, it would be very bad for these software-intensive planes to fall out of the sky for it. But it also introduces vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities that we as humans in the loop help introduce because you have the public who doesn't understand the workings of these things. And so we as software engineers have to build things that become, you know, relatively idiot-proof, that we have a responsibility to build systems that are difficult to break. But that has not been an economic concern in the past. It is so now. Yeah, And obviously there's the balancing out with still making the software intuitive and easy to use. Right. It's one of these engineering tensions that we spoke of. We want things to be incredibly functional and simple and cost nothing and be perfectly secure and simple. And yet we're the master illusionists because we're building these systems with hundreds of millions of lines of code below the surface. And there's an intrinsic complexity that one simply cannot escape. So apart from that, what other sort of challenges do you see for the software development industry? <clears throat> Gosh, what other challenges? Um, I'll th uh, th three come to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, first is that there hardly are enough people to build all the software and systems we'd like to, like to have. No matter what future you might envision, it relies upon software that has not yet been written. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about the situation in, in England, but certainly in the United States, we, don't, we are not graduating enough students mm -hmm. to build all the software intensive systems that we anticipate. Mm -hmm. Uh, needing. And this is particularly true of, of women and minorities in computing. There, as you look around uh, uh, a, a class or even within organizations, in, in industry, you'll find that there are far fewer women in our field than, than there are in comparable engineering fields. So that's certainly something we need to attend to. Uh, and that's going to impact future generations. Um, I think the other area is that there are economic costs that we're just beginning to understand. I don't know the exact figure, but if you look at a Google search, uh, take a cup of tea and, and boil it, the energy cost for boiling a single cup of tea is about equivalent to a single Google search. Now multiply that by the billions upon billions of searches that go on, and this is real energy. So 
for the individual doing these searches, it's free, but the aggregate costs are indeed very expensive. I think someone told me that, that Google's data servers, data farms, consume as much energy as a certain small country. So these are non-inconsequential by any means. And that's an economic implication I think we have to deal with. The third is an individual issue. Uh, Sherry Turkle speaks about it in her book, Alone Together, um, in that as we, as individuals in society, continuously surrender ourselves to computing, it, asks, it raises us the question, what does it mean to be human? Uh, I live in Maui. And it's invariably we'll see this beautiful sunset, whales dancing, and you look over to the side and you see this family that's buried in their iPhones, getting their iTans. It's like, what have they done with their life? Have they have chosen to bury themselves in this technology as opposed to participating in the world? And I think that's a change that software has led us to in the coming years that we need to come grips to come to grips with. Okay, that, that sounds like a negative. I can imagine. Well, not necessarily a negative, but one could have said the same thing about the introduction of the car or the mm -hmm. telephone or the radio, or for that matter, the book, mm -hmm. the books. Uh, the church was not very happy about the introduction of, of Gutenberg's press by any sure. means. Yeah, and if you had looked at the things that the, the Pope was tweeting back then, you would have found, wow, this is, this is evil. It's the spawn of Satan. And people are saying the same thing about our, our iPhones. Mm -hmm. I think the reality is that or, or at least my opinion is, I have great confidence in the resilience of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. And we will find a way. And we will change, and we in the, in the process will change computing along the way. So it's not a negative. I think it's, it's a reality that we okay. have to cope with. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's all the new technologies. You're not going to... Embedding yeah, in society. And there's no law that's going to get rid of it. This okay. is inevitable. Mm -hmm. And it's irreversible unless you're in a, a certain country where you try to ban these things, but the problem is it's, it's really difficult to do so. Look at the results of the Arab Spring, for example, where you find nations trying to ban technology. It leaks itself out into the world. Yeah. You touched on um, the lack of people coming into computer science mm -hmm. and programming. That is an issue in the UK as well. Have you heard <coughs> about the Raspberry Pi device? Oh, yes. It's wonderful. It's I was awesome. Ask you your, your, your thoughts on it. It rocks. <laughs> it really does. A uh, wonderful device. I remember growing up, I built my first computer at 12 mm -hmm. from little individual parts. And later on, and sort of prior to the personal computer era, this is when you saw a, a lot of devices like that that one could just play with. Mm -hmm. the, one of the challenges now is that if I look at a device such as yours, uh, there's nothing behind the screen that I can fiddle with. Mm -hmm. And so the introduction of things like the Raspberry Pi give you an opportunity to play and hack and try things. So I'm delighted that the Raspberry Pi exists because it creates for this generation the opportunity to play. And one should be playful in the presence of this technology.